Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? Good, good, good. My name's Nathan. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, for those of you who are new, um, I saw a lot of new faces today. So glad you guys chose to spend part of your weekend with us. We are in a series going through the book of Acts, and we've got to witness just some amazing truths about the church and what the church should be and how the church should act in 21st century. And it's very simple, but it's very hard to do. And it goes against the grain of everything that we see or hear in society. And that's nothing new, but we've learned how the Holy Spirit came. We saw all the miracles, and just in the last few weeks, we've seen the Sumerians that, were, that got the gospel. And then we saw Cornelius last week, the despised Gentiles, a race of people that were despised by the Jews for over 2,000 years get reconciled with each other through the blood of Jesus. And it was incredible. And what a lesson that is for us because the hatred and the disgust and the, the whole just debates on certain things and politics, it's disgusting and God hates it. Y'all realize that? It's disgusting and God hates it. All these people that are supposed to be part of a church that are arguing over things that will not make any difference in eternity, God can't stand it. I hope you realize that. Let me say it one more time. God cannot stand it where we fight over things that make no difference in eternity. And my goodness, just a light reading of Scripture teaches us that. A surface level reading of Scripture teaches us that. And last week where, where Peter proved to the Jerusalem church, the legalistic party of circumcision, where it's like, look, the Gentiles received the Holy Spirit. What was I supposed to do? How was I going to get in God's way? And they said, glory to God for the Holy Spirit has fallen even on the Gentiles. There's not a context we can relate to in 21st century America on the gravity of that. And the next few verses we're gonna look at today is one of the greatest events in the history of mankind and in the history of the church. Because when you look at Cornelius, he pursued Peter. Remember he got that vision? He sent his servants and one soldier to get Peter and bring him. So the church had not yet actively pursued the Gentiles until today. And so basically what we're gonna, we're gonna look at the gospel being deliberately and beautifully shared with the Greeks, the Gentiles. Again, a race of people that were despised by the Jews for 2,000 years. Remember, if a Gentile woman was in childbirth and she was having complications, the Jewish nation would say, leave her alone. Hopefully that'll be one, maybe two less Gentiles in the world for 2,000 years, and the blood of Jesus immediately and totally conquered that because he fulfilled all of that. And so now the disciples are gonna approach the Gentiles, and so our, our main scripture reading is gonna be the last half of Acts 11. So we pick up in Acts eleven nineteen, 19, and it says this, now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, remember a few weeks back we talked about Stephen and that beautiful message that he preached to the Sanhedrin talking about how all the fathers and all the prophets were fulfilled in Jesus and his work at the cross. And they, they threw him in a pit and they hurled rocks at him until he died. That's what he got for it. For doing the work of the Lord, he got stoned to death and great persecution scattered. And look where it says, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. It's like, all right, we're gonna share this Jesus, but we're only gonna share it with Jews. We're not gonna share it with the Gentiles. And so basically when we look back at chapter eight with Stephen, it showed how the, the persecution broke out and it scattered the church everywhere. And remember what it said? It said anywhere they went, they still preached the word of God. And so at the same time, they went further north. And so now they are well outside of the Judea area. They are in, in pure Gentile country now. There's no real Jewish influence other than what's in the synagogues there. And so Antioch is about 400 miles north of Jerusalem. 
And so basically they're, they're, they're going there. And so we pick up in verse 20 and it says this, but there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord, say Lord, the Lord Jesus. Now, the, these would have been Greek-speaking Jews, and so they would have been felt comfortable speaking to the Greeks there in Antioch. And Antioch, it's important we understand about that city. It was a major ancient metropolis in the time of Jesus. And it was, it was the third largest city in the known world behind Rome and Alexandria. The population was estimated around a half a million people. It was uber cosmopolitan and liberal. And just five miles outside of Antioch was a goddess of, of uh, I know we got mixed audience in here, of, of desires and pleasures with prostitutes. And so all that had permeated into Antioch. And so it was really a vile and just really bad place from a moral standpoint. There was no regard for the soul, no sanctity of life. And it was basically everyone did whatever everyone wanted to do. But it was also noted for its culture and its trade. And so it was a huge area where, where the Romans focused a lot of effort because of the strategic geographical location of it. And so it's, it was a place of learned men. A lot of philosophers were there, but it was a lot of pagan worship. And that's the reason they preached the Lord Jesus, because they could have said the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, that would have meant nothing to these Gentiles. They're like, who in the world's Abraham and Isaac and Jacob? The dude Joseph, what are you talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about. And, and here's the thing, I'm just gonna say it. The church has got to get better to not get so theologically advanced from the stage that people can't understand what we're saying. Paul said, all I want to know among you is Christ and him crucified. And so they're talking about the Lord Jesus. And they're saying what Jesus did. And here's what I tell everybody. I had a great conversation uh, earlier this week with someone uh, that just through a series of events ended up at our lobby and was an atheist. And I said, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. You're, you're awesome. I'm like, what are you talking about? And so I, I just told him, I said, look, you've got to deal with the fact that there was this dude named Jesus. He told his followers, hey, we're going up to Jerusalem. I'm going to be handed over to the high priest. I'm going to be flogged. I'm going to be crucified. And on the third day, I'm going to say, hey, what's up? And he did it. We got to deal with the risen Jesus. Regardless of all the other theological spectrums, you got to deal with the fact that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, period. You got to deal with that. And so that's what they're telling this. And that's why they're not doing, remember the, the sermons that Peter was, was preaching and Stephen, it all went back to the Old Testament and how Jesus was fulfilled in that because the Jews related to that. That's what they worshiped was their theology and their religion. And they were all like, that's great. That's all fulfilled in Christ now. And that's where they got so stinking mad and started throwing rocks and, and killing them. And so here's the other thing. It says, but there were some of them. We don't know who it was. God used these individuals to literally change the trajectory of his bride, the church. And we don't have a clue who any of them are. How many people are sitting in here right now that want to be part of the movement of God but want zero recognition? Because that's what the church needs. We don't need people saying, oh, well, I did this and I did that and I led this ministry and I led that ministry. Listen, it's all level at the foot of the cross, and we don't do anything apart from Christ. No one knows who these individuals were. And look at what happened because of their humility and their willingness to preach the Lord, the King of Kings, Jesus. In verse 21, and the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. And this is an important verse. The hand of the Lord had two meetings. It had the, the power of God to be wrathful and issue judgment, and it, so when, when some of the Jewish armies in the Old Testament would go into battle, it would say, but the hand of the Lord was with them. So even though they were heavily outnumbered, they were able to lay the smack down on their adversaries. Smackdown's a word, don't worry, learn it in theology, don't worry about it. But they were able to lay the smack down on their adversaries because the hand of the Lord was with them, but it meant something else, a blessing. They had the blessing of God. He allowed all this to happen. 
and almost all the places in the New Testament where Jesus is faithfully and humbly and truthfully preached, many people respond. So my question is this, if we all here were to go out and faithfully, humbly, with the right heart, share Jesus, what would happen? Who knows? We see what happened here. It's the same God now as it was 2,000 years ago. Same, we get the same Holy Spirit that they got in Pentecost. I wonder what would happen if we took these dad burn things and we set them down, took a hiatus from them, stopped trying to prove people wrong. Like, no way, I'm going to do that. You know what I'm going to do that? Oh, you crazy. You can't do that. Oh, look what he did. Look what he and had the right heart, the right heart, just like what Ryan was talking about, the right heart, I wonder what would happen. The, the other interesting thing that it says, it says they believed and turned. It gives a beautiful depiction of what a true salvation is. Because remember, you hear me say it all the time, repentance. And, and I'll say it again, there's no sinner's prayer found in the Bible, nowhere. Repeating a prayer after another man does not save you. Now, I'm not saying people haven't come to Christ through that. I'm just saying that in of itself does not save you. It doesn't. You don't just accept Jesus into your heart. You've got to repent. And it says right there, they, the great number who believed turned to the Lord. Repentance is an is a actual mind shift. It's a change of your mind and a change of your heart where you leave your desires and your wants, and you submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? So Paul's writing the church in Thessalonica, and he gives a beautiful explanation of this in 1 Thessalonians 1.9. He says this, For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. You see, you can't, you can't serve both. You can't. To serve something other than God is heresy, is to have an idol. I don't care if it's something good. You know, I don't care if it's kids' travel ball. I give you all a hard time about that, I know. But, man, I tell you what, man, you parents, whoo, when it comes to travel ball, cheerleading, dancing, look out. I don't want to mess with you all. But it can be something that's good. But have you ever heard someone say the, the enemy of God's best for us is good? What's well, good? Maybe it's your retirement. Maybe it's your stuff. I don't know. But we've got to turn from our idols and turn to God. That's repentance. It's beautiful that it says that. The apostle John, in 1 John 2, 15, he says this. Do not love the world or the things in the world. For if anyone loves the world, you love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Uh-oh. What are you in love with? Because if you're not in love with God, and what he wrote to us, listen, John's clear. The love of God's not in you. We've got to fall back in love with God. So the Gentiles believe, they repent, they turn to God. And that should give us hope because I get it. I hear people all the time, man, look where this country's going. And man, I just wish Jesus would come back. And man, look how bad it is. I'm sure Jesus, first off, we ain't got a clue how good we got it. We ain't got a clue. You go back to this early church, where Peter would say things like honor the emperor who was nailing Christians to a cross? Come on, we got it good right now. We don't even know what persecution is. We don't have a clue. And so, but they're like, oh man, it happened in Antioch, one of the most vile and hateful cities. That should give us hope if revival could happen there. And here's the other thing, we'll learn it's where all three of Paul's missionary journeys started. He started in Antioch and would go around to places. So God used Antioch in a huge way. So word gets back to the Jerusalem leaders. Verse 22, the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Again, a lot of things had to be validated by the leadership in Jerusalem to make sure that this foundation was secure because Jesus said to the ends of the earth. And so they had widespread Gentile conversions they're like, what in the world's going on? And so the Spirit chose the perfect person to go. God doesn't make any mistakes. And so they send Barnabas. Barnabas was the guy back in chapter four that sold property 
and laid it at the apostles' feet. He was the one that, that looked past Paul's past of murdering Christ followers and, and saw that he had a genuine conversion and he was literally reborn into a new creation in Christ Jesus. The same thing that happens to us. And he saw that. And so he vouched for Paul to the apostles. He said, I've seen him. I've seen what he's done. He was a major encourager. He was a major sympathizer. He looked past people's failures and mistakes. Boy, it'd be nice to have a bunch of him in the church, wouldn't it? We want to judge. And listen, if you're a person that's going to judge people on their past, I, I just I don't know if Hendersonville Church is the church for you. I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you. I, we we got to look past that. We got to get that and shake it off of us. It is God's job to judge. Now, if we got to do church discipline or something like that, that's a different story. But anyone, as long as they don't represent a threat to this flock, anyone's welcome through those doors. I don't care who they are. I don't care. I don't care if they're Antifa. I don't care if they're Proud Boys. I don't care who they are. They are welcome to come through this door and get presented with the greatest news ever, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if and listen, if you don't like that, that's cool, then... This isn't a church for you. It's not. We got to love everybody, regardless of choices or beliefs. Because I'm telling you, I've watched it. Just at Hendersonville Church, when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of somebody, it's amazing. We've got individuals in this congregation right now that not too long ago were actively worshiping Satan. Right now. And they are some of the strongest Christ followers I know now because the Holy Spirit saved them. We've got to look at things through the eyes of Christ. Also, Barnabas was a native of Cyprus, so he could have related to these people as well because he's just an island about 50 miles off the coast, so he could have related. So the Spirit sent the perfect person. Now listen what happens in verse 23. When he came and saw the grace of God, we're gonna get to that in just a moment, he was glad. And he exhorted them to all remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. Uh, uh, again, when he gets there, it's not like he saw, it doesn't say he saw people, people all of a sudden changed. No, it's, what did he say he saw? The grace of God. We're gonna get to that in just a moment. But, but that Greek where it says he was glad, he was, he was elated. He was rejoicing. He was so happy. What, do you realize it's a miracle when someone comes to Christ? Do you realize it's a miracle when the Holy Spirit saves somebody and they are literally recreated into a new creation? When someone truly meets Jesus through repentance and faith, we need to rejoice. I guarantee you the angels are having a party every time that happens. We need to rejoice. When he says he exhorted them, he urged them, he pleaded them to remain faithful and steadfast to the Lord, and, and in that Greek, the root word there is, is like a faithful heart. Again, everything goes back to our heart. Everything does, and that's what he's telling them. Look, times are gonna get hard. You've got to remain in the Lord with steadfast purpose. And when he says remain, it's abide. You ever heard that said from the platform up here? A few hundred times? Abide in me, for apart from me you can do nothing. It's what Jesus says. We can't do anything apart from Christ, nothing. Verse 24, talking about Barnabas, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. Now, now this, is, this is cool. Where it says a great many people added to the Lord, all that was done by God. So really, the way you almost could, could read that is the Lord added to the Lord. God, for his good pleasure and for his glory, added to himself. That's what God does. God is infinitely holy, beautiful, perfect, powerful. And it is, we are put here to glorify him. And for his good pleasure and for us to see that just the awesomeness of God, he added to himself through his believers. That's what God does. Apart from God, we don't do anything. We do nothing apart from the work of God and the Holy Spirit. So verse 25, Barnabas knows 
man, I can't do this all by my own. So it says, so Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. Now, here's the cool thing. Do y'all remember about, I don't know, three, four weeks ago when they got Paul out of Jerusalem because he was starting a storm in Jerusalem, preaching Jesus to the Pharisees. And they got him out, saying, man, he's too hot to handle. Jerusalem can't handle him right now. And they got him through Caesarea and back to Tarsus. Just so you know, when you, when you read some of Paul's letters to the church in Galatia, the church in Thessalonica, here's what you learn. It's almost eight or nine years that's passed to where Barnabas is going to look for Saul. So Saul's been in his hometown of Tarsus preaching Christ and him crucified, and he's probably trying to avoid getting killed as well. But here's the thing. Again, the Holy Spirit chose the perfect person because Paul was well-versed in, in, in Jewish religion, trained by the best, but he was also a Gentile. He was a Roman citizen. He was in Tarsus, which is not far from Antioch at all. And then he also was brave. He was steadfast. He didn't have any problems with an onslaught of debate, none. Now, here's the thing. Paul was made perfectly for that. Jesus even told, remember when we were talking about Ananias, where he told Ananias to go? And it's like, dude, you're crazy, Jesus. I ain't going. This dude's beheaded tons of people. He's stoned people in jail. Are you kidding me? What did Jesus say? He will be my chosen instrument. You see, from the foundation of time, God was prepping Saul. He was prepping him. And here's the thing. Everybody in here has a different past a different experience, a different context. And God's used it beautifully for his glory. It's just a matter of are you willing to obey and commit and follow Jesus in whatever he's called you to do? Because I will tell you a couple of facts. It will not be easy, but it will be absolutely amazing. It will be. The past six, seven years have been by far the hardest of my life in more ways than 50 I wouldn't trade it for anything, though, because I've got to see the wonder of God. Everybody in here has a purpose. Everyone in here, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're called. You are. Everybody in here. Now, if you're not following Jesus, I will stay here till midnight and talk with you after the service. There's, there's, time is limitless. If you're in here and you don't, you don't believe in Jesus, that's cool. Let's talk, Okay. And so we pick up in Acts 26 and look at what happened. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now, what makes probably some theologically advanced people feel a little bit uncomfortable here. What did they do? The first place where some people want to go to, oh, they taught. So we got to get the word of God and we got to, man, we got to hammer this in. We got to get in rows and someone's got to sit up here and got to teach, 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 teach so people can learn the Bible. That's important. But there's only one reason that's important, that it transfers to their heart. The first thing they did was they met with them. You see that? For a whole year, they met with the church. They did life together. That is discipleship, where we meet, where we spur one another on to good works, we bear one another's burdens, we hold each other accountable, we celebrate when others celebrate, we cry when others cry. That, my friends, is discipleship. It is not a six-week course. It is not some process. It is doing life with each other. That's what the early church did. And I'm just telling you, it's like the church in Iran. You ask them what the biggest enemy of the church is. It's not liberalism. It's not sanctity of life. They said it's theology. That's what they'll tell you. Because we get so wrapped up in it. It says they met with the church. They loved on people. They started to build trust with each other. That's what we've got to go. We've got to get out of these rows and get into circles and do life with each other. That's discipleship, y'all. And here's the thing, when we do that, listen, nothing formed against us will stand because if, if, if we do that and you get to know me, and let's say I'm a, I'm a, a poop head to you one day. I think I can say poop head from the platform. Anyway, you're going to be able to say, I know Nathan. 
I, I, I trust Nathan. He would never act like that unless he was going through something. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to be even nicer to him, and I'm going to pray for him versus you just thinking I'm a honey hole. Do, do, do you follow me there? That's why I do it. Listen, if you're doing life alone, you're as good as dead. You're as good as dead. You can't do it on your own. But that's what they did. Everybody wants to look at that word taught. It, by the way, you know they didn't have a New Testament then, right? Like, you do realize that. Like, there wasn't any scripture written right then. So it wasn't like they said, now turn to me to the Gospel of Luke, and we're going to look at the, no, no, no. Again, it's, don't misunderstand me. Don't walk out here saying, well, he doesn't care about reading. No, no, it's crucial to know the Word of God. It's, it's literally his letter to us. But the only reason, it was never meant for information. It was meant to transform us to be more like Christ, which is in our heart. So if you've got all your knowledge up here, it's rubbish. It's got to transfer to here. All right, I'll get off my soapbox. Verse 27. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them named Agabus, well, he'll, he'll be in later chapters, stood up and foretold by the Spirit there would be a great famine all over the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So Claudius ruled, he was the emperor from roughly 41 to 54 AD. And these famines are recorded that they took place in around 45, 46 um, AD. And so listen, listen what, what this church does. Verse 29. So the t- disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it by, to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. Back in chapter 4, we covered it. Remember how the church, a lot of the congregation felt called of God to sell their possessions, sell their land, lay it at the apostles' feet, and distribute it to all as any had need? Remember that? In the early church, right after these, these writings and these meetings, first century, maybe second century, I think I've told this a couple of times, they have what was called the wailing pit. There was zero regard for human life in Rome, zero. And so they would take these kids, if they were born with any kind of a, of a unique or special need, or there was a kid that got injured, you know what they did? They, they would take them out of the gates, and they would kind of just chuck them. They would throw them on, on, in a pit. And it was called the wailing pit because the kids would literally cry themselves to death because they'd get hungry, they'd, they'd pass out, and they'd, bring, they'd come back up. Vultures would fly down and want to pick on them. I mean, this, this all really happened. Well, guess what the early church did? They waited out there. And they would point at those kids. That person's made the image of God. That person's made the image of God. That person's made the image of God. And they brought them all in. To the point, a rumor went around the Roman Empire that these crazy Christians were bringing in kids and sacrificing them. That's the rumor that got started. Folks, <laughs> we, 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 we've got to understand the unity and the love of the church has got to supersede anything. It's got to. We've got to not be known for what we're against. We've got to be known for what we're for. My goodness, I, I see these, some of these leaders, and they're wanting to get into things. That I, again, they don't make any difference in eternity. None. Well, Nathan, do you have your personal beliefs? Yeah, what are they? It's none of your business. It's none of your business. That's between me and my wife and God, and that's it. This platform is for Jesus Christ and him crucified, and that's it. We've got to start, and man, the, the kindness to help the mother church, to help the people that despise them and want them all to die for 2,000 years. And they sacrificed to send all that to the church in Jerusalem because they trusted them to distribute it out to anybody that had need. Wow. Man, if churches in Henderson County would do that, look out. Look out. It'd be amazing. And so I want to I recap. So we, we've seen how for the first time ever, the, the church, the ecclesia, for the first time has pursued the Gentiles and has preached the gospel to them, and they have gloriously come to Christ. So this all begs some questions for us. So, so as I wrap this up, I want to I talk about three questions that I need to ask myself. And the first one is this, do I emulate Christ in everything? Remember in verse, the, first, the second part of verse 26, it said this, and in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. 
They didn't call themselves that. Now, the word there for Christian, it, it takes the Greek word for Christ, Christos, the Messiah, and then it's got another little Latin term on the end of it that, that means a follower of. That means a follower of Christ. And so that's, you'll rarely hear me use the term Christian because I like the term a follower of Christ or a follower of Jesus much better because the term Christian has, has had this, because here's the thing, if you truly follow Jesus, we're, we're brothers or sisters. If you truly follow Jesus, it's, it's that simple. And so it wouldn't have been the believers that named themselves. It sure wouldn't have been the Jewish people because it, it literally said following the Messiah. Well, the Jewish people, the Orthodox Jewish people to this day, they do not think the Messiah has come yet. So there's no way they would have called them that. The people who called them that were disbelieving Greeks because there were so many that turned to this guy named Jesus, they had to make up a name for him. They had to. They had to come up with a name. What are we going to call these people? And, and they're like, basically, it's like these Christ folk. It's kind of the slang term. And it would have, it would have been in, in kind of a, a contempt, kind of making fun of them. But like, man, the way they're loving on each other, the way they're trying not to have their, you know, physical pleasures met, all this, man, they're weird. But they also have this peace, man, what's going on? So they named them Christians. And, and, they, and then they used it with contempt. And here's what the, the early church did. They took that term from contempt and they turned it into a term of respect, of adoration, of wonder. Because people say, man, I want to be like that. If people look at us, would they call us Christians on a Friday night? Would they call us Christians on our social media? Would they? Would they call, if, if, you're, if you have to have your social media looked at, would, would they say, oh, well, they must be a follower of Jesus? I mean, would they? I don't know. It's between you and God. But it sure would have been for these people. And, and that's, that's the thing here at Hinesville Church. We are followers of Jesus Christ, period. That's what we are. Whatever Jesus tells us to do, we're going to do it, okay? But if you look at, at Peter, when he's writing to the church in 1 Peter 2, 21, he says this, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you what? An example that you might follow in his steps. Let me tell you what the Greek means there. It means whatever Jesus did, we're supposed to do. Wherever Jesus went, we're supposed to go. Whatever Jesus loved, we're supposed to love. Whatever Jesus despised, we're supposed to despise. Do we love like Jesus loved? Because if we did, there wouldn't be anywhere near the red chairs in here that I see. Now, that said, I'm shocked we have such a great crowd, but I'm just telling you, we, we wouldn't. If we loved like Jesus loved, and we went past politics, and we went past masks, and we went past vaccines, all these things that don't mean anything in eternity. You can get mad at me. I said it. They mean nothing in eternity. If we look past all that and love people with that agape love of Christ, people are like, man, those people love Jesus, and they've got a peace, and I want that. We've got to start making the main thing the main thing, y'all. Ephesians 5.1, be imitators of God. That, that Greek word is literally like a mirror reflection of God. We're supposed to act just like him, period. Next question, do I give according to my means? And this is where people, oh, great, here he goes. He's not asked for anything since I've been coming here. Now, here he goes. He's got our trust a little bit. Now, he's going to start asking for money. No, I ain't going to do that. God doesn't need your money. Um, but Acts 29, look at what it says in the first part. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief. Now, this is a big deal, y'all. This is a big deal, and, and this is something we don't ever want to talk about is our stuff. And here's the thing. We got to give what we feel like God's laid on our hearts to give. And so when you look at Paul's writing to the church in Corinth, and he says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each one must give as he has decided what? In his heart. Again, here's the thing I love about Scripture. Decided. That is a, we would think that is a mental execution, right? That we are doing something mentally with our brain. It's not what God says. It's not what he says. 
Your, your heart, and bottom line, my wife and I have a very good knowledge of the heart because between our two children, there's been nine open heart surgeries. And so we, we have a pretty good knowledge of the heart. The heart does nothing mental, nothing neurological. It pumps blood to the lungs and to the body. That's what it does. Decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. In other words, you don't need some preacher up here saying, you gotta give and get right with God. No, 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 not under compulsion. For God loves what? A cheerful giver. The writer of Proverbs, look what, look what he says in 11, 24, and 25. One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. That's not a monetary richer. It's not. It's, satis, it's satisfaction. You know why? Look at the very next verse. Another withdraws what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings a blessing will be enriched, and one who waters will himself be watered. You've heard me say, if you want to get refreshed, refresh others. It's one of the most refreshing things you can do. But, you know, remember the rich young ruler when we, when we did our Encounters with Christ series? And he comes and he falls down at Jesus' feet. Lord, Lord, he knows he's Lord. What must I do? I've kept all these commandments. And Jesus said, one more thing. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come follow me. And he walked away sad. He walked away sad. Jesus didn't pursue him, by the way. He walked away sad. But Jesus didn't want his money. Jesus wanted his heart. He wanted him to have joy and peace and true abundant life. And I, I'm telling you, I'm just going to say it. I know so many wealthy people that are miserable right now. They are scared to death on what's going to happen to the economy or what's going to happen to land prices or stock prices. And, and they, can't, they can't let it go. And I feel terrible for them. I do. I hurt for them. But man, if, if you want to just feel pure joy and elation, Hey, test God in it. He tells you to test him in it. You will have a peace. I promise you, you will. To give up an empty life and, and, and grab hold of the good life. It's like Jesus talking to his followers in Luke chapter 6. He says, give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Each person gave according to their means. You know, we've got people that literally earlier in the year were homeless and we've been working with them and now they've got a place to stay and, and they're giving like crazy. And I don't, I don't understand how they're able to do it. They have to be skipping a meal or something. And they said, man, we, we just love it. We, we love what the church has done for us and we love giving to the greatest movement in human history. And again, you give what you feel led of God to give. But if you're giving out of your abundance, you're not gonna feel that, that peace. You're not. You're not going to. If you give sacrificially, because I've had so many people come to me, well, preacher, 10% ain't found nowhere in the New, New Testament. You're right, it's not. By the way, Old Testament's 23.3%. We can talk about that later. But I'm just saying, we can, it's not, it's not found anywhere, but everywhere I look, it's sacrificial giving. So, but God loves a cheerful giver, so just pray about it because God doesn't need your money. Hendersonville Church does not need your money. We don't. We want you to give your heart to God because then we get to see life change. Last one, this is huge because the first two don't happen with this, without this one. Do I focus on the grace of God? Do I focus on the grace of God? Remember, the, the church found out about it. They sent Barnabas to travel almost 400 miles. Remember, he didn't have a Lexus or a private jet. He had to walk there or ride a camel or something. I don't know what he did. He had to travel 400 miles to Antioch, and he saw this. Remember what it said he saw? Look at verse 23. He came and saw what? The grace of God. You know, Nathan, what is the grace of God? You know, basically in the Old Testament, New Testament, there's, there's different meanings. In the, in the Old Testament, it's mainly the loving kindness of God to his people is really through it is, whether it's through adding to the storehouse, whether it's through overcoming obstacles, whether it's conquering other armies, uh, the, when it said the grace of the Lord was upon them. But then in the New Testament, it, it's kind of like this idea of a, of a, uh, a, a divine favor of, 
um, goodwill, um, that which gives joy, a gift, unmerited gift. We talked in our men's group how, how dudes don't like getting a gift that we didn't earn. I, I can't stand handouts. Now, I've learned to take them, especially over the past two years. I'm not going to rob somebody of a blessing. But, but my whole thing is, is we, we don't understand the unmerited, and sometimes it's given the exact opposite of what you deserve. Because I, I'm going to go ahead and say it. There is one thing that God Almighty owes us, only one. You know what that is? Hell. That's the only thing he owes us, is eternal separation from him in a place called hell. That's what he owes us. But God. Ephesians 2, 4 through 9 is amazing. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, that, that Greek word he uses there is literally a corpse, a walking dead person. How many walking dead people do you know right now? How many people do you know that are gonna spend eternity burning? How many? Cancer ain't got nothing on it. How many people do you know were dead in your trespasses, made us alive together with Christ? By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. Folks, that's grace. That's God giving us the exact opposite of what we deserve. The exact opposite. You know, I'll never forget in high school. Um, some of you knew me in high school and shocked I'm even up here after knowing me in high school. Um, but I was speeding down a road at a high rate of speed. And a state trooper pulled me over. And he said this. And I wasn't a follower of Jesus at the time. He said, I should give you a ticket for careless and reckless driving. He said, I really could put handcuffs on you. But he said, I'm going to give you grace. And I'm going to let you off with a warning. Now, here's the thing. We're just talking about a speeding ticket that I might have lost my license or something like this. God, God gave us grace in Christ Jesus. When Paul's writing the church in Corinth, he's, he, he's, he's telling about what Jesus said to him. And he says this in 12.9. He says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore... Paul's saying, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. See how he's correlating the two, grace with power of Christ? Jesus says, my grace is sufficient for you, but the power of Christ. See how he's put him, grace is the power of Christ? Again, Paul, later on in Acts, he says to the leaders there in 2024, he says, but I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself. If only I may finish the course and the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel, which is the good news, which is Jesus, of the grace of God. Here's the thing. Jesus is grace. Jesus is grace, and we've got to focus on the grace of God. The apostle John the beloved disciple that Jesus spent so much time with, he said this in the first chapter of his gospel. He said, and the word, meaning Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son of the father, full of grace and truth. For from his fullness, we have all received what? Grace upon grace. That Greek there is an infinite amount of grace that can never be taken away from us in Christ Jesus. Listen, folks, we need to celebrate that. We need to focus on that. If there's ever been a time in society, at least for our context, that's screwed up, it's right now. I can't think of anybody who wouldn't say that the world right now is a dumpster fire. If there's ever a time we need to focus on the grace of God, it's right now. 
and not on the hatred or what's going on. Jesus is grace. And be, because of that, only because of that, we can be like Jesus. Again, in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, he says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, regardless of what you're going through. If you're truly following Jesus, you've got sufficiency in all things at all times. He will give you the grace to get through what you're going through. It's incredible. If Jesus is, is grace, and we're supposed to focus on grace because Barnabas literally said when he got there, he saw the grace of God poured out on that beautiful new church of those people who were despised for 2,000 years, then we need to focus on Jesus and focus where he is. I love the first four verses of Colossians 3. I love it. Look at, listen to this. If then you have been raised with Christ, then seek the things that are above. In other words, up there where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. That's how the early church was able to get through this stuff, y'all. For you have died. Listen, if you're, Christ, if you're in Christ, the old you dead. I love talking to some of you in your stories. I mean, I'm so glad that guy's dead. And I've been recreated in Christ. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Wow. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Listen, folks, the day's coming. Politics ain't gonna have the last word. Viruses ain't gonna have the last word. Cancer, drug addiction, homelessness. Jesus Christ will have the last word, and when he does, we will be glorified. Think about that. Focus on that. That's real. Not like the news, not like Fox News or CNN News. And again, if you want to know what's going on, fine, watch that. But if you want to know why it's going on, read this. Read this. Let this permeate over your entire mind, heart, body, and soul. And I promise you, you'll sleep like a baby. I'm going to put that list up one more time. Ask yourself these questions this week. I mean, but before... Before you go and, and get on Facebook or TikTok or Insta or the news, ask yourself this. Do I emulate Christ in everything I do? Husbands, are, are you loving your wives like Christ loved the church? Wives, are you supporting your husbands? I mean, parents, are you spending time with your kids? Are you loving them? Kids, are you honoring your parents? Emulate Christ in everything, not just in here. What are you going to be doing Friday night? What are you going to be looking at tonight? Emulate Christ in everything. Give according to my needs. Hey, you, you want to start seeing God move? Start giving with a cheerful heart. Don't give to make a deal with him. Listen, if you're going to give in these boxes when, when summer comes up and hosts, if you don't give that to make a deal with God, don't just keep it. I'm asking you to keep it because we don't need that kind. We need it from cheerful givers. Again, a lot of you were here when I told about the land. God honors people who give sacrificially. We're talking about an individual who's never stepped foot in this service that calls me out of the blue and says, God told me this lamb was Hendersonville Churches, so we need to obey him or not. I mean, this is all going on through a pandemic. We planted this church literally in a pandemic. This is all of God. So if you're giving to make a deal with God, well, I got I to gotta give 10%. I made $1,000. I give 100 No, no, no. Keep it. Please keep it. I want, we want cheerful givers. They're like, I cannot wait to give to the movement of God in Christ Jesus. That's what we want. And then focus on the grace of God. Listen, suicides among teens is quadruple, quadruple what it was just five years ago. Mental illness has gone through the roof. 
we got to start focusing on what's the real thing. And it's not masks or vaccines or politics. It's not. Don't worry about that stuff. Pray and, and do what God tells you to do. Focus on the, and here's the thing. Here's the final question. Do you know Jesus? Because if you don't know Jesus, there's no grace. There's not. There's no grace if you haven't repented and done what those people did and you've turned and you're turning towards God. Now, you're still going to mess up. We all mess up. And God loves us through that. But here's the thing. If you don't have a true relationship with Jesus, I'm begging you. If at anything, just fill out a care card and say, I'd like to talk to a pastor. Or if you know someone that we need to pray for, and pray the dangerous prayers. God, do whatever it takes. You willing to pray that? Are you willing to pray, God, do whatever it takes? Put them on a care card so we can, be, so we can pray for them. But guys, listen, you want peace? Come talk to me about this guy named Jesus. Because when you truly repent and you turn to him, oh, doesn't mean your life's going to get easier. Matter of fact, your life probably will get harder. Because the enemy will hate you, and he'll come at you with everything he can. So it'll probably get harder, just so you know. But please, we've got people right now, right now in Crusoe, right now, that are trying to help those people. We've got a crew of people going to a family's home to figure out how we can help them tomorrow, I believe. That family's in the congregation right now that lost everything in the floods. Now, there's only one reason we're doing that. It's because God loves those people. We don't know anybody in Crusoe. But we've had member after member. We got members that have their equipment up there right now that are losing thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And it's like, if not us, who? But they got a peace. And they know God will take care of them. But if you don't know Jesus, I'm telling you, none of this works. So I'm begging you. I, listen, I've stayed here till 5 o'clock on a Sunday afternoon talking to people. We will not leave until every single person has a conversation, period. We won't. I love it. So I want to pray, and I'm also going to pray that those of you who need to make a next move will not be a wimp and will actually do it because God is calling people right now to make next moves, whether that's baptism that's coming up, we've already got people in our baptism workflow, whether that's Christ, whether that's to give, whether that's groups, whether that's serving, I don't know. But I'm going to pray God do whatever it takes. Because let me tell you something, man, we're just getting started. I can't wait to see what the fall looks like. If y'all knew what was bubbling around in my head, y'all be like, oh, Lord. Ryan's like, okay, Nathan, I'll take the gas out of that gas tank, buddy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Holy Spirit, I beg you to move on the people in this room right now. God, every one of us need to make tangible moves to grow and connect more with Jesus. God, I don't know what's being called the individuals in here. I, I, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what you're up to. It's not for me to know. But God, one of the most heartbreaking things that I see is when I see someone that is crazy talented and has been called and they don't do it. God, it's just tragic. It breaks my heart. God, we're all, if we're followers of Jesus, we're all called. And Holy Spirit, for the, for the people in here who, who don't, they're, they're still searching don't have peace and, and maybe they got some doubts about Jesus God, that's cool that's fine God I'd love to talk to them because until we truly wrap our head around who Jesus is and what he did and why he did it there's no grace there's no peace God we love you we thank you for starting the greatest movement 
in the history of mankind a little over 2,000 years ago that we get to be a part of here at Hendersonville Church. So God, continue to equip us. And God, make us radically bold to go out in the community, to love the unlovable, reach the unreachable, to do things that no one else is doing, God, so that we can just watch you move and watch you add to yourself and just let us be a part of it. God, I do want to pray for the flood victims. And God, I do want to pray for those in New Orleans that are in the path of this hurricane. Uh, God, we don't, we don't know why you allow these things to happen, but you're God. Um, you don't owe us an explanation. Uh, but God, unless something changes, it looks like there's going to be a, a massive amount of devastation in that area. So God, we just pray you protect people. And God, most of all, we, we pray people come to know your son through. As God, homes can be rebuilt. But God, souls spend forever somewhere. So thank you for what your words taught us. And we ask and proclaim all these things in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen.